Hey, when it comes to writing, are you a jack of all trades? Can you do poetry, fiction, nonfiction, computers, write a column? Guess what? Our next guest can and does. We have a very talented writer with us today. Can't wait for you to meet him. My name is Vin Aquino. His name is John McMullen. John, let's talk writing. Good morning. Good morning. Well, you are a jack of all trades, and you come all the way from Wall Street to a novel with short stories and poems, uh, your column. Tell me, who is John Mack, and what do you do? I've been lucky that I've been in the right place at the right time a, a number of, of, of times during my life. I, uh, I started as an English major. Oh, wow. And I wrote in high school. And I didn't know what I, would, I was going to do after college. I wound up going to law school in the evening because I, I was interested in the law. But while I was at Iona, the fellow would ask me if I was going to take the government test. And I said, no, I don't think so. I don't think I want to work no, for the government. Tell me a government test. That means a test that allows you to do... Yeah, there was a test that may, that may still be called the Federal Service Entrance Examination. Oh, okay. And then people took that, and depending on where they stood in the roles, they, uh, they got inquiries from different agencies. Oh. But I had no interest in it. But he said, well, it's something to fall back on, and it can drive me up, because I lived in northern Manhattan, and I went to college in New Rochelle. So I, I agreed to it, and I signed up for it. But as, as things went in my old neighborhood, I stayed out to close one of the local bars the night before, <laughs> and I was talking till 5 o'clock in the morning, and I wouldn't have gone to the test if I hadn't made a commitment to him. But I slept for an hour. I picked him up. Fate. <laughs> and I did well on the test. And for a few years, I, I was getting the inquiries about border guard in New Mexico and IRS audit to when I didn't know anything about accounting. And I kept saying no, no, no. And until so finally, I received one from the Department of Defense that they were doing a pilot program at the Brooklyn Army Terminal, a management trainee thing. And they made a big hmm. deal that they had, they had reviewed 20,000 or 200,000 wow. applications. And they were going to interview 200 and they were going to pick four then I got my juices flowing so I went out and I took the interview and I wanted being one of the four I was lucky enough to walk around for six months going into different areas working a little while but learning and then they asked me what I wanted to do and I said I want to go over there with the computer people <laughs> only because they were, the, they were the smartest people that I talked to there so I stayed two years there, then I went off to Wall Street, I was with Dean Witter and Company, and I wound up heading up their computer operations, then I was with a consulting company, and while I was with the consulting company, we made the pitch to Bates Halsey Stewart, and uh, one, of, one of the people was a woman who was very interesting, but, but they didn't buy our, our uh, proposal. Six months later, or a year later, I had a call from another client that Morgan Stanley, and they asked me if I knew this woman who had applied for a job, and I gave her a high recommendation. <laughs> then I wound up going with Morgan Stanley. And eventually, we wound up getting married, and, oh. and we, we were leaving to form our That's own company. That's what I call standing by somebody. <laughs> we, were, we were leaving to form our own company to do large systems uh, computer consulting. And I happened to be by an elevator, and a fellow said, I understand you're leaving. And I said, yes. And he said, have you seen the computer on Ben Rosen's desk? He was our electronics analyst. I didn't know him at the time. He wound up as the, as the venture capitalist and the chairman of a compact computer company, very successful. So I went up, introduced myself, and, and we looked at an Apple II. And I said, gee, that's nice. Maybe I'll buy one of those. And I did. And three months later, the first electronics spreadsheet came out that became the killer app that sold computers. Wow. And we were there. And uh, so we were training all over. We were installing systems for Wall Street firms and for banks. And then uh, they asked the people who had developed the spreadsheet uh, to write the column for a magazine called Popular Computing about spreadsheets. They didn't do that, but they recommended my wife. Oh. So she wrote the article, and I edited it. 
and then other people ask us to write, and then from then on, I do the writing. So that's where writing. And I wrote a book on uh, on microcomputer communications for John Wiley and Company. They weren't used to things that changed very rapidly. They had they had yeah. some computer books about programming languages. It took a year to get the book out. A fellow that I knew started when six months after I did from McGraw Hill cut us out before us. Then one of the reviews on our book said, very well written, but adds little to what Neil Shapiro already said in the center. Uh, <laughs> I feel like throwing it out the window. <laughs> then we got involved in a very interesting project called Digital Delhi. It, it was a compendium of, of things on computers. It was way ahead of its time. It didn't sell many. But William F. Buckley was a contributor, Henny Youngman, wow. Ray Bradbury, John D. McDonald. Wow. And, and you, can st oh, you can still find it on the internet. And then mm. we did consulting. And, and then um, I happened to wind up involved with the Apple User Group in New York. I went up as the president of it. And a fellow there asked us to teach at NYU, teach a course. Then we wound up going to the new school. And then we wound up going to Marist College. So all of the time there was consulting, there was, there was writing for magazines. Uh, for a while, I was also the editor of an online technology service called News Bytes. I was the East Coast editor. Then that got me into writing on, on computer crime, hanging around with all cops and with hackers. Very interesting. Mm. And then uh, as, as we went full-time teaching, and I happened to be walking, walking through Barnes & Noble where I hang out with a bunch of people when I'm not teaching. And I came across a book of poetry by, by Charles Bukowski. Now, I hadn't really read a poem since I graduated from college <laughs> as an English major. Most people haven't. But, but the title interested me, so I picked it up and I said, this guy's crazy, but I could do this. And I happened to see the quote in a motorcycle magazine. I ride motor scooters. And uh, it interests me on uh, the, that the mind writes checks that the body can't cash. Wow, and the mind uh, writes, writes checks that, that the, the body, body can't, can't cash. So Interesting. I wrote, so it interested me so much that I wrote a poem about it. And then someone said, gee, that's interesting. You ought to do something with that. So I submitted it to a poetry contest, and I forgot about it. And they called me about six months later and said, you won fourth prize in this contest. It was a subscription to poets and writers Twenty-five dollars, and oh, they publish yeah. it all over, and that started the whole thing. And now, that book up there has one hundred and ten collected poems. Jan, you don't happen to have that poem with you, do you? It's in a book. Oh, you know what? I'm going to take the risk of getting it down here. And let's see if I can. That would be great if you could share that with us. So this is that was really your first success story with poetry. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, now we have to find it. Here it is. Page 175. Okay. And this is from the book. Wait a minute. This is from the book, New and Collected Poems, John Mack, the Bard. Okay? okay. Go for it. Thank you, sir. Cashing a check. I, I, I just saw this wonderful line in a column in the motorcycle magazine. The mind writes checks that the bodies can't cash. The vision that many from the old neighborhood have of me is, is short and thin with a Pepsi in one hand and the cigarette in the other. <laughs> Others will remember me as taller and thin, hitting a jumper from the corner or throwing a no-look pass to a cutter. Others will picture me at the end of, of the bar in the Roadstone with an open pack of, of pell mells and a half-finished beer in a bar, John Gibson's I Can't Stop Loving You and the jukebox. Mm. Pat, one more and you get a chance. <laughs> Age has taken the jumper, diabetes has taken the Pepsi, common sense has taken the cigarettes and booze. <laughs> I'm older and wiser and hopefully more tolerant. I'm satisfied with my life, but to just be able once more to fake the man guarding me and go up with the jumper and get nothing but net, to be able once more to cash that check. Wow. Nice poem. Uh, so that won fourth place, national contest. Right. And then uh, 
you started writing more and more. Yeah, well, I had written the column for a while from the Westchester Business Journal while I was uh, working on Wall Street. And I, uh, I wound up calling the Westchester Guardian and suggesting that I write on the subject that interests me uh, called creative disruption, meaning how the technology changes everything around us and we don't really notice it till it affects us. It's under the radar. Now, did it automatically go to a column, or did you just write an article here, article there, and then it became a column? I said I want to write a column. Oh, okay. So, and, then and I started off leading okay. into it, talking about how the disruption has changed music, education, photography, writing. And it's that all of a sudden that we notice there is no more Tower Records, that there are no more film stores in the mall, that there are no more of this, and we really, mm. it doesn't hit us until we can't get a film developed or, or our brother-in-law has been laid off by Kodak mm -hmm. or whatever, so it's aimed at that. So I do that on a weekly basis. And then Ed Koch, the ex-mayor of oh. New York. Oh, the uh, great Ed Koch. How am I doing? <laughs> he, used, he used to write for us, and he passed away. Wow. So I was able to pick up some of his space, and I write a semi-regular column on sports, on... Uh, oh. On, um, well, you really are an all-around writer. Yeah. One of the articles is uh, about how I happen to have part of the goalpost from the 1958 uh, giant, giant Colt game, the overtime game that was considered mm. the greatest game in pro football history. So I do that, and I... I've moved more and more into not being a part-time writer who does other things, but being the full-time writer who does wow. other things. And I've started the website, and I, and I have, I've got podcasts and videos up there. Now, I've seen your, your website, and there's amazing things on there. Uh, what is the website again? www.johnmac13, and John Mac is J-O-H-N-M-A-C-1-3 dot com. Okay, and we'll have, in fact, we have it on the screen now. Okay. Uh, and I urge all of you, go to that. There is such fascinating information. Uh, so, uh, so you became a columnist, you, a, a columnist, and you do this all, uh, every week? There's yes, a, yes. Wow, wow. There's one weekly column, and it's, it reminds me of uh, the quote by the great Red Smith, who was a sports columnist, yeah. for the Herald Tribune for the time that says sometimes you have to sit down by the typewriter that was his vehicle and just open a vein because it puts a real discipline on, on what you have to do. All right, tell me about when you do your columns. Uh, there must be some research involved. Yeah. So yeah. what do you have to do? What kind of homework do you do? Well, um, I, I'm online all the time when I'm not teaching at SUNY Purchase and, uh, and I, I tend to write the column normally on um, Sundays or on Mondays at, at my local Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm. And I use a, uh, a, a Google Chromebook to write most of the articles. Then I go home and I download it to a Mac and, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I spell check it and, and, and then I send it to my wife who does the editing because I, I've written over, over 1,700 articles and columns and, and three or four books and I can't type. I'm. <laughs> I do the same I'm thing. Like this, I'm so. a hunter and pecker. So, so, so she does the editing, and I, I have to get it in by Thursday, and and then it's published online on Sunday. Wow. And in print like this, the uh, on the, the following Thursday. So that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you have to get it done, get it, get yeah. it to them. Now, how do you send it to them by email? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And now you mentioned. Uh, this little writer circle that you have at uh, Barnes and Noble, right. where you guys get together and you sit and you talk about what you're doing and what you're writing. I know Don Wurtzman's part of that too. Yeah, uh, he's. A, I, a I fact, love his books. John just wrote a, the poem that's kind of a a conservative screed against President Obama, and he's then he's been reading that at the at, yeah the writers at, group at the Mayapac Writers Th group. That's another uh, thing we should mention that you are also part of our weekly writers group right. at the Manpac Library. Right. Uh, and you share some work right. with us there. Then, I know Don has been with us for a couple of years. And then, then last 
Friday night. Don and I read at the open at the open mic session that the Hudson yeah, Valley. Yeah, I understand there was a little uh, back and forth there. That's a wonderful place, by the way. The Hudson Valley the Writers Center. The Hudson Valley Writer Center. It's in the Philipsy Manor train station. They own the train station. Wow. And every 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 month on the third Friday they have an open mic. Wow. But they also have they also have lectures and courses. And, and you don't have to be a member or anything. You can just go in or yeah. yeah. Is there? So wow. so. So, so Don didn't realize that before he read his poem, that one of the poems that I read called Don would be kind of a parody uh, on what he was going to do. Uh, so we had a good time. Yeah, so a li little bit of roasting there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for, so open mic, I mean, you, you even do open mic, and you do this weekly column. And then on top of all this, we have a novel, short stories, poetry. Tell me about the Inwood book. I grew up in Dinwood, which is, is the northernmost tip of Manhattan Island. And I grew up, it was an Irish Catholic Jewish neighborhood that was known for having more bars than any neighborhood <laughs> in New York City. Walter Winchell called it Ginwood. Uh, and so, so I grew up in, in this culture. Now, the neighborhood has changed quite a bit. It's, it's, it's the yuppie Dominican neighborhood now, broken up in different areas. And mm -hmm. there, are, there are still the Irish, the Irish Catholics, and, and the Jewish folks, but they're a minority now. So, so the novel that I wrote is the mystery set in that neighborhood with some police officers and some FBI agents that I know personally. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that, and I also have, have some poems about the neighborhood, and, and also some short, some short stories, some factual stories about the neighborhood. I, I'm presently putting the bunch together called Tales of Inwood wow. that I hope to have out in the the winter, and and it will it will lead into history of the neighborhood. And I, I was all set to write the history, and, and until I started reading Downtown by Pete Hamill, which is just a wonderful book. Oh, yeah. Downtown Pete by Hamill Manhattan. Pete a great writer. And his writing about Lowell Manhattan and the history made me so envious that I, have, <laughs> that I have to rethink the way that I want to do it. Wow. He's a wonderful writer. So tell me, what's the title of the actual uh, novel? The, uh, the novel is Offering It Up. And if you grew up in, an, in that time in an Irish Catholic neighborhood, if you, if, if you fell and hurt yourself as a kid or if something happened, the answer to it, well, 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 offer it up. It'll, it'll cut your purgatory time. So <laughs> the name of the book is Offering It Up. That's funny. And it's a mystery? Yeah. Uh, give us a little hint about the mystery without giving it away. Because we want them to get the book. The hero encounters a, while he's, while he's trying to regain some health, he's, he's jogging around Inwood Park, and he, he comes across a body. Ooh. And he he sees a young fellow running away, a, uh, so he starts to chase the guy, and he he winds up falling down a hill, and the fellow that he's chasing comes back to help him, oh. and it turns out that he's a Dominican fellow who ran away because he was sure that he'd be that point to him. He had stopped to try to help the guy, realized he was dead, heard 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 the. Uh, the hero would yell at him, and he took off. It turns out that he went to the same high school as the as well, the wow. fellow Tall Hollows in the Bronx, where I went. And uh, it leads from there, and it, it involves some connection with an old girlfriend. It, it, it involves some connection with the FBI agents and some police officers, and uh, so it's a wow. I I enjoy doing it. One of my other projects will be a follow up on it, but I also would like to put together a, a, a collection of, of the creative disruption columns. I'm up to 75 now. Wow. And to, and to try to, to bring them together. To do that would take some work, and I'd be looking for a, some kind of a uh, to guarantee before. The others I'll just do on my own. Now, I know with athletes that sometimes they have this little thing that they do on their own. It's not for competition. It's just to build their strength. Now, poetry is sort of 
your mind exercise. You do poetry pretty much for you, don't you? Yes, I do. Just to kind of get into your own head and see what you think. Talk to me a little bit about the themes yeah, that you do people, in poetry. People have asked about, about the writing and the columns. I write all of the nonfiction to try to have people understand what I understand. I'm, I'm kind of an evangelist. Like I had volunteered to be a, uh, in this Apple user group. I went as the president. I was an officer in another user mm -hmm. group. I, I do some volunteer teaching to seniors at Marist College in, in wow. technology. So that's the nonfiction. The fiction are stories that I want to tell to people. Yeah. The poetry is something that helps me understand who I am. What are so, some of the revelations that John Mack has made? Uh, that much of my history that I thought was irrelevant made me what I am. There you go. I did a, a story about when I'm seven years old, my confrontation with my, with my first a little black child, because Inwood, Inwood had very few Italians, they had no Protestants, and it was all Irish and Jewish. And the fellow taught me something that I remember for all of my life about, about tolerance. Uh, I also, some of my army experiences, when I came face-to-face uh, -face with bigotry in mm. Oklahoma, where, where the bar that was owned by, by my platoon sergeant wouldn't serve black fellows from my unit who he had invited my whole unit down wow. but they should have known it didn't mean them and wow. you know and so so it, it it brings back all these things and it made me realize that the the, the six months that I I spent in the army thinking it was a big waste of time <laughs> was not because it yeah. got me to work with people from all over the country it taught you different diversity education. and tolerance right it was terrific it was wow terrific. wow so so you experiment with that, you write your poems about it, you get to know who you are, and all of this seems to come together to create who you really are. Now here's some major questions for our writers out there because I know they want to know this. You're doing a weekly column, you're meeting with writers, when do you write? What, what, I mean, do you have a, a set? time like you know every day at 8 p.m. you start writing or how does that work no I should but I don't <laughs> I have a, a demanding puppy who, who wants to go out <laughs> who wants some attention oh we also have the have the teaching so I I write when I can but my schedule tends to be to write the columns on um, Saturday or Sunday uh, to get them finished by Tuesday so my wife can edit them and and get them off off to the editor by Thursday now I I tend to write better in the bookstore uh, because I'm not as distracted as I am so you in, actually in my house. write in the bookstore yeah Wow a yeah. lot of it anyhow yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, now do you do handwrite do you work on your laptop always always on the computer the only the only the only handwriting that I do is I'm if I'm sitting someplace and something catches my attention and I will write a poem there right so but I po won't poetry yeah. you do that but you don't do that with the columns no now what about the novel now you're, you're thinking of doing a the sequel yeah. right uh, to the offering yeah right to so offer it up to all offer well, bring it up. It up. Yeah. Uh, so now, when will you do that? Uh, God knows. <laughs> I don't sleep. I don't sleep that much. Uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, but I, I can't uh, imagine that you do. But I, I am in the process of of going back and going to another process that I just saw in a book of st of structuring the book, even though I've started to write it, of, st of structuring it in a different way, so that I have some idea of where I'm going. The first novel. I let the characters take me where I was going. Here, I want to know from the beginning who the characters are and what, what roles they, they, they play in the novel. So we'll see how that works out. Mm -hmm. But All that's right. the third priority. The number one priority is the, is the tales of Inwood. Uh, and then after that, if I can get someone to fund the development of, of the great uh, disruption book, uh, I do that. No, the tales of Inwood. Will that will that be a mystery again? No, that will all be stories of 
some of the things that happened, like people st stowing away on the Queen Mary and lighting a cigarette for me. And in it's not going to be a collection of stories. It'll be a collection of of tales. Tales, of the but put things, together as one novel. Right. Not as a novel. All oh. true. Things, oh, it is going to be short stories. Things that happened. Okay. Not, not even short stories. Uh, wow. Memoirs of. Uh, oh, wow. Of things so you're that gonna happened. Tie, so you're actually going to marry your talents as a nonfiction writer with a fiction writer, kind of put that together. In a, one hopes. Wow. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, all right. And um, final thoughts, things that you want writers out there to know about writing. I think that number one, that you have to, to be driven to write. There are a lot of people who say, gee, I could write a book. Well, if you're not doing <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter. That's right. What I tell them, writers write, talkers talk. A, a friend of mine who, is, who, is the, who was Newsweek's uh, Vietnam correspondent and then was an editor of the number, the magazine said, don't say it, sell it. <laughs> yeah, oh, that, that's good. Uh, so you need to write, and you need to understand that writing is not a hobby for you. Right. It's and, a passion. And also, if you, if, if you don't have personal connections, like I call people and I say, I want to write for you. But if you don't have personal connections, you have to, you have to be able to take rejection. You have to send things to people, That's and, right. they, and if, if they don't like it, someone else may, yeah. or, or they may give you good recommendations. But Stephen King, supposedly, according to his on writing book, which is the best book that I've ever read oh, on writing, Stephen King's on on writing, on writing. and he he was rejected either twenty seven or twenty nine oh, yeah. times, and he just he just kept you, it up. You yeah. have to get used to rejection if you're going to be a writer, and he did fairly well after that. And it's also important, isn't it? who you give your books to. I mean, you can't just let anybody read the work and then say, you know, oh, gee, they didn't like it, so I'm not a good writer. Right. I mean, could it also be they're not a good reader? <laughs> you know, sometimes you give your book to the wrong person. Uh, I, I've talked to a couple people who said, you know, I sent my book in to a publisher and uh, they sent me a rejection card. They didn't even have the courtesy to give me a letter. And I say, who's the publisher? And then they tell me and I go, they don't publish that kind of book. And they said, yeah, but they might have made an exception. Wrong. You have to, you have to read the magazine. Absolutely. You have to, who does what. Every year there's a writer's digest guide to fiction, yep. to nonfiction, mm -hmm. and to agents. You have to read that. You also have to have some confidence. I mean, uh, since I was in grammar school, I knew I was, I was a good writer. And yeah. even, you have even, to believe in yourself. Even when I wasn't writing for a publication, I wrote memorandums and I wrote procedure manuals, and I wrote other things for brokerage firms, and I knew that I could write very well. Well, not only do you know you can write, we know you can write. Uh, you've written some wonderful things. Those things need to be shared with the public, and you need to go on the John's website. You need to see what he's doing. You need to read his column in the Westchester Guardian. Uh, read what he's doing. Listen to what he's doing. And stay tuned to this show. Keep watching. We're, we have a number of wonderful guests still coming in. Stay tuned. Stay with us. John, thank you. we can't thank you enough for thank being you. with us.